Jeremy Veldman, Brian Hancock, welcome to another episode of Telescope Tips. Now we're doing this one social distancing style because of COVID-19. Hope everybody is staying safe and healthy. Now we did an episode previously on eyepieces, got some great information. I would encourage you to check that out if you haven't watched that episode already. But we thought we would shoot this follow-up episode because we get a lot of questions about eyepieces and they can be very costly. So we thought in this episode we'd actually explore some alternative eyepieces that are more cost effective as well as discussing a couple things that uh, you, you should probably consider when uh, selecting eyepieces. So Brian, why don't you tell them what we got here today? Okay, so what we have on the table is on the far left here, we have some eyepieces that may come with a telescope that you've purchased. On the right, we have a premium expensive eyepiece and in the middle here we have something in between so before i begin with why why you may want to upgrade your eyepieces let me give you an option for improving contrast that is almost free the only thing you need to do is grow to kroger buy a cake now this is called a death loft eyepiece shade now it's named the Deathloft eyepiece shade because an amateur astronomer named it a Chuck, I believe his first name is Chuck, Chuck Deathloft, um, came up with this. Astronomical viewing is all about contrast. You don't want any stray light. The only thing you want to see is the object that you're looking at in the eyepiece. Now even if you have a premium eyepiece, if you have a lot of stray light, coming at the eyepiece at an angle, you're going to lose contrast. I can highly recommend this. This is one of the best astronomy hacks that I've ever done or ever read about. If you get the Sky and Telescope April, April, excuse me, April 2017 uh, edition at the very end, you'll see an article about how to make this. But basically all I, all I did was um, I bought a cake, I believe it was a chocolate cake, from Kroger and the lid of the cake I painted it matte black I cut it out so that I could get my fat head in there to observe and I created wings by getting some felt paper at Hobby Lobby and using velcro I just put some wings on the side and on the front now I've got a two inch focuser on my uh, telescope so I cut out two inches in the middle and I set this on the focuser and the really cool thing about this is when you're observing and you put your head in here it's going to block any stray light I cannot tell you what a difference this makes so even if you can't afford to upgrade your eyepieces right now maybe think about making one of these it will greatly improve the contrast I highly recommend it now if it's in the fall or the winter early spring uh, one thing you can do is just you know wear a hoodie you know get a sweatshirt that has a hoodie pull the hoodie over and um, and cover up your head and the eyepiece as you're viewing that's not so great in the summer so again for improving contrast I highly recommend this so let me set this to the side and let's talk about what uh, Jeremy said at the beginning. Um, you've uh, purchased your new telescope and you have a question. And, and we get this question a lot. It's, I've got this particular scope and I'm using this particular eyepiece and I'm just getting mushy views. I, I don't know what's wrong. Is it the eyepiece? Is it the telescope? And the first Telescope Tips episode on eyepieces covered this a little bit. And um, basically, one of nine times out of ten, it's someone trying to use too much power to observe. And perhaps your telescope or seeing conditions don't allow for using that much power. Now, often when we give this answer, there's a little bit of pushback because people say, hey, I want to see things like I see them on TV or in a magazine or online, and uh, that's why I'm trying to use so much power. I want to give you an alternative way to choose your eyepieces than thinking about power 
and that alternative is exit pupil. You should use exit pupil to choose your eyepieces, not necessarily how much magnification you want. So the first question is, how do you determine exit pupil? Now, we gave you the formula last time for um, determining magnification. What's the formula for exit pupil? Exit pupil is you want to take the focal length of the eyepiece, and usually that focal length is just written right on the, uh, on the eyepiece, 32 millimeters, 25 millimeters. You want to take the focal length of the eyepiece, and you want to divide that by the focal ratio of your telescope. And usually when you buy a telescope, the focal ratio is either written on the telescope or you can find that in the, uh, in the um, uh, instruction manual that came with your telescope. But if you don't know, you find the focal ratio by dividing the focal length of your telescope by the aperture of your telescope. So for example, I've got a 16-inch uh, Dobsonian um, and the focal length is 1800 millimeters. So if I divided 1800 millimeters, don't make the mistake I always make and then use inches. You've got to convert it to millimeters. So you convert the 16 inches to millimeters, that gives you about 404 millimeters. So you divide 1800 by 404 and I come up with a focal ratio of 4.4. So that, that would be how you would find your focal ratio if it's not listed. So to find the exit pupil, again, divide the eyepiece focal length by the focal ratio of your telescope. Usually the most recommended beginner's telescope is an 8-inch Dobsonian, and most 8-inch Dobsonians are going to be 1,200 um, millimeters in focal length, and they're going to be f6. That's going to be the focal ratio, usually. There are definitely some exceptions. So if I want to get, let's say, a 2 millimeter exit pupil, then what would I need to do? If it's f6, that's pretty easy. I need to get a 12 millimeter eyepiece, and that'll give me a 2 millimeter exit pupil. So why should you think about exit pupil instead of magnification? And I'll tell you why. Once you go above like, uh, you know, five millimeters exit pupil, if you got a really wide field eyepiece, a problem you can get is if you have astigmatism in your eye, that astigmatism is going to become a lot more apparent with a really bright exit pupil. Let's say you have floaters. Once you go to about 0.5 millimeters exit pupil, uh, maybe even below one millimeter, then those floaters are going to start showing up in your field of view. Also, once you, below, once you go below one millimeter, you start becoming subject, and even at one millimeter, you become subject to the seeing conditions. And that's what we have tried to give as an answer to people when they say, why am I getting these mushy views? I've got this, you know, four millimeter eyepiece. I'm using it in my telescope and it just looks blurry. I don't like to view. Something's wrong with my telescope or something's wrong with this eyepiece. Maybe it's the seeing conditions. Maybe that's why it's not that clear. So if you decide to not go below one millimeter, which in general I, I recommend, then you you just match the focal length of the eyepiece with the focal ratio of the telescope. So again, that beginner's telescope, that eight inch job, what's the focal ratio? It's F6. So what's the lowest focal length that you wanna get? Probably a six millimeter. And then you will still find that you have to have good observing conditions before you can use that eyepiece. So, to review the, uh, just to clarify the uh, exit pupil, um, it also depends on what objects you like to observe. Do you like looking at open clusters and uh, deep sky objects? A lot of people find that three to four millimeters is best. For looking at deep sky objects, 
usually most people they feel like between 1.5 and 2 millimeters is the lowest they want to go uh, because once you start getting too much below then then the um, then the uh, exit pupil is so dim that it's difficult to really make out any detail uh, now if you're looking at planets and uh, and you feel like you're a planet guy you like looking at Jupiter you like looking at Saturn then by all means one millimeter maybe even down to 0.5 millimeters is fine just realize that that's probably not going to be your most used eyepiece if you talk to most amateur astronomers ask them which eyepiece just kind of stays in the focuser usually it's something that gives them two millimeters and up that is their general use eyepiece so let's take a look at some recommendations for um, for some eyepieces that you know won't make you sell a kidney I'm still going to begin with the premium eyepiece and I, I want to answer a question you know should you just go all out and buy a premium eyepiece and it really depends on your scope I can think of at least two cases where a premium eyepiece will not give you your best view uh, for example, do you have a 16-inch Dobsonian that's F4? Now, one reason you may want to think twice about buying a premium eyepiece for the F4 scope is first answer the question, am I using a paracore? Am I using some kind of coma corrector? Because anything F5 and below is very demanding on eyepieces. So if you put a wide field eyepiece in the focuser and the telescope is F4, you're going to see a lot of coma at the edges. That's going to be in some, in some way, that's going to be a wasted field of view at the edges because it's going to look like little comets all around the edge. So if you're not using a paracore or some other type of focal, um, uh, I'm sorry, some other type of um, coma corrector, then you're not getting the full benefit of that large field of view. Uh, I can think of another example. Some um, um, achromatic refractors, they are F5. And, uh, and I really understand this because I use a binocular telescope and it is F5. At F5, if I use um, an eyepiece that has, say, 82 degrees field of view, I can start to see some field curvature at the end. That's not the eyepiece, that's the scope itself. It's demanding when you start going F5 and below. So if you're using some kind of scope that's F5 or below, you may want to reconsider, is it really worth buying such a, an expensive eyepiece for that scope? So let's go back to the very beginning why would you want to upgrade your eyepieces? You bought a new telescope, and this is a good example of some eyepieces that come with a brand new telescope. This particular eyepiece design is a Kellner design. And frankly, they're not the best design for uh, contrast. And so it is totally possible that you put this in the focuser and um, you know the, the problem with Kellners is you can get some lateral light scatter um, especially if the edge of the lenses aren't blackened well a uh, Kellner is a it's uh, I believe it's it's uh, three elements in two groups as, as how they're made that that means you have three lenses and one group has two lenses and another group has one lens and if those if the edges of those lenses aren't blackened or aren't baffled well or not multi-coated then you can get a lot of stray light and it's all about contrast right you start losing contrast and it doesn't give you your best view so that's why you may want to upgrade 
um, the eyepieces of your telescope. Again, if you can't afford to upgrade, by all means make the Deathloft eyepiece shade. Use that. It'll really help. But that's why. And actually, um, I sacrificed one of these eyepieces. I opened it up and I did verify it's the, definitely the Kellner design. So <clears throat> we're going to not get the premium. We want to upgrade the Kellners that came with your scope. What are some choices? You can stick with Teleview and you can get a Plossel. A Plossel is uh, what a lot of telescopes also provide. When you buy a new telescope, they may provide you a Plossel instead of a Kellner. Hopefully they do. And a Plossel is also, you know, you can get a very cheap Plossel that's, you know, maybe got questionable coatings, maybe the Maybe the edges aren't blackened, and uh, you can still have some problems with light scatter with a Plossel. But a Plossel is a little bit more complex design, just a little bit. You get four elements in two groups, and the elements are identical, so they'll be spaced. And um, the good thing about a Plossel is it's a good all-around eyepiece. This uh, Teleview Plossel, I believe it's $130 new and you can sometimes find them used for about $99. And like I said, it's a good all-around eyepiece for looking at deep sky objects and for looking at planets. The bad thing about Plossels is you're never usually going to get more than 50 degrees field of view. With 50 degrees, it'll look a little bit like looking through a straw. And the other problem is the wide field plossels, the uh, 32 millimeters, the 40 millimeters, they have really good eye relief. But let's say you want to get a planetary eyepiece. Let's say you want to get a 10 millimeter plossel. The, um, um, I believe the Teleview, I believe the Teleview plossel is 11 millimeters, but I'm not exactly sure. It may be 10 millimeters. The problem is you start losing eye relief. The eye relief on a Plossel is usually about 70 to 80 percent of what the um, of, of what the eyepiece is. So if it's 32 millimeters, you're looking at about 20 millimeters. Hey, that's perfect. That's that's good eye relief. But the problem is you get like a 10 millimeter Plossel, you start looking at about like eight millimeters eye relief. Now, every person is going to be different at how much eye relief they need. So this was pointed out on the first um, Telescope Tips episode on eyepieces. If you're an eyeglass wearer and you wear your eyeglasses even when you observe, then you have to have um, an eyepiece with a lot of eye relief and that's not going to work for you. I don't wear glasses, but I've got sunken eyes. So I still like a lot of eye relief. Personally, I can't handle anything less than 15 millimeters. 15, less than 15 millimeters eye relief and I, and I feel like I'm trying to poke my eye out when I'm observing. So the problem with plossels is like I said, you want to get a planetary eyepiece and so you want to get down, you know, you say, well, I want a 10 millimeter eyepiece. If you have the right facial morphology for that and you don't wear eyeglasses that's fine if you do wear eyeglasses or you've got a neanderthal face like i do that's not going to work so that's the good and the bad about the plossels now the this is an agena star guider ed and i think but i, I don't know because i haven't taken it apart I think this is based on the Erfel design because this has 60 degrees field of view. I actually sent an email to Agena to try to ask them, you know, hey, is this based on an Erfel? They said, we really don't know. But an Erfel design has pretty good eye relief. It's 60 degrees field of view, and believe me, you are going to be able to see the difference between 50 degrees and 60 degrees. It does make a big difference. Now for the Erfels, the good thing about Erfels is they make really good wide field um, eyepieces. So if you're looking at 25 millimeters, it's going to give you a nice field of view. 
And um, if you're looking at something like the Orion Nebula, um, uh, Andromeda, you know, open clusters, this is perfect. The, the problem is, the problem with an Urfl, it has the same kind of, uh, it's, it's similar to a Plossel that once you start, but, but in a different way, once you start going to the lower focal lengths, like an eight millimeter or a six millimeter, the Urfls are not very good planetary eyepieces. They, they still have some light scatter. They're not known for contrast. And so they don't make the best planetary eyepieces, but they make really good wide field eyepieces. But the price is really right on these. Uh, this is 60 bucks an eyepiece. The same eyepiece is sold by, um, I believe it's um, Astrotech. It's called the Astrotech Paradigm. And it's the same exact eyepiece, different branding. But an Urfl is a good choice. Um, I have not had the chance to use this yet, so I can't give a full-fledged recommendation. The weather here hasn't been great. Uh, got this a couple of weeks ago. It's been cloudy ever since. Um, so once we have a chance to use this, maybe we'll post just like a follow-up comment, let you know um, how this is done. The next high piece that I can highly recommend, I use this eyepiece at least 40 to 50% of the time, is the APM 18 millimeter ultra flat field. Now, again, I don't really know, but I believe this eyepiece is most likely based on um, a wide field eyepiece, uh, perhaps a Nagler, um, that um, Al Nagler, um, invented and uh, a wide field eyepiece is you start getting to 65 degrees 70 degrees 84 degrees now these are much more complex eyepieces than a Plossel or an Urfl with a wide field eyepiece you can get like six to eight elements in four to five groups and so blackened edges and multi coatings are very very important now this eyepiece is about hundred and thirty dollars again that's not chump change right but for hundred and thirty dollars you can get a really good eyepiece in the APM I've compared this eyepiece head-to-head -head with the um, uh, with the Teleview uh, delight line and um, I've, I've got a, a little bit different um, uh, set of criteria for choosing eyepieces because I do use a binocular telescope so I always have to buy two eyepieces um, and um, and I just find this more comfortable to use than the delight and the stars are crisp from edge to edge I highly recommend this eyepiece but still it's not my favorite all piece my, my, my favorite eyepiece my all-time favorite eyepiece is the Morpheus. The Morpheus eyepiece, you get up to 76 degrees field of view. So you're still, this is still a wide field eyepiece, probably based on the Nagler design. Again, I don't really know, but you know, that's, um, let me look at my notes here. It's eight elements and five groups. So again, it's a very complex eyepiece. This eyepiece has very comfortable eye relief and it doesn't matter what the focal length is. They make it from 17.5, I believe down to 4.5. They all have 20 millimeters eye relief. So if I were looking for another planetary eyepiece, then I would have no problem getting the Morpheus. And, and for my eyes personally, 76 degrees field of view is plenty. Actually, once I go more than 82 degrees, 84 degrees, if I get up to 100 degrees, one thing about using um, eyepieces with such a wide field of view is you actually have to roll your eye around to see that field of view. And I find that a little annoying. I, I like to stay at about 76, you know, to 84 degrees. And so the Morpheus, this is the most expensive 
eyepiece that's in this group. And the Morpheus is, I believe, 230, 239 new. Again, that's pretty expensive. That's, that's a pretty good chunk of change. And, um, and it may be about two thirds of what you paid for your telescope. But it's an eyepiece that's worth it. And you can find it on the used market for about $180. And last, for my recommendation, this is my planetary eyepiece. This is the Mead Series 5000 Ultra Wide Angle, and I used a 5.5 millimeter. That keeps me a little bit above a one millimeter exit pupil, and I find this eyepiece a pleasure to use. The eye relief is okay. It's about 14, 15 millimeters it's a little bit tight you know actually some people have measured it at 13 millimeters so even for me I don't wear glasses this eyepiece is a little bit tight but it makes an excellent planetary eyepiece again if you need that extra eye relief if you need 20 millimeters I would go with the Morpheus line I would get the Morpheus 4.5 and get that little bit of extra eye relief for your comfort so that kind of covers it for our recommendations. Like I said, when you're choosing an eyepiece, I recommend you think more about eye relief than, I'm, I'm sorry, I recommend you think more about exit pupil than you think about magnification. And that concludes my discussion. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel, feel free to write us. If something's still not working out for you, we want to help let us know what kind of telescope you have, what kind of eyepiece you're using, and uh, we'll be glad to try to help you troubleshoot it. Thanks a lot, Brian. Yeah, I'll tell you, I've had some great views through that 31 millimeter Nagler eyepiece. It definitely is a premium eyepiece, but uh, also pretty costly. You pay a premium for it as well. So just some cost-effective alternatives to consider when you're building your eyepiece collection. Now, you don't need 15 to 20 eyepieces. Really, all you need is, is maybe two or three. A good low power, a good medium power, and maybe a high power for planetary, and that's it. So, some great options here for you to consider. Now, I want to remind you guys that the Memphis Astronomical Society meets the first Friday of every month, Christian Brothers University, at 8 o'clock p.m. Now, we are shut down temporarily due to COVID-19, so we're broadcasting our meetings live on our YouTube channel until the pandemic subsides. So, again, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Stay tuned for more updates. And uh, if you'd like to learn more and you'd like to join our, our, our email distribution list, go to the website joinmas.com, enter your name and your email address, and we'll send you updates. For, uh, for Brian Hancock, I'm Jeremy Veldman. Thanks for watching. Hope this was some good information for you guys. And we'll see you on our next episode of Telescope Tips. Hey guys, this is Brian Hancock again. I wanted to provide you uh, with a link that I think will be very useful for you. If you're not on cloudynights.com, by all means, go on there, look at the IP section, and um, just kind of go through it. I mean, there's just invaluable information there. But uh, one link I want to give you is by Don Pensack. Uh, Don Pensack is the owner of um, eyepiecesetc.com, a good place to buy eyepieces. But he's got a 2019 eyepiece buyer's guide and it, it's an Excel format and you can put in the focal length, the focal ratio of your telescope and he's got almost every eyepiece listed on this Excel spreadsheet. It's really valuable information. It, it'll let you know, you know, what your true field of view is going to be with what particular eyepiece that you've chosen or what the exit pupil is going to be. And so I highly recommend uh, taking a look. Uh, he put in a lot of work with that. And um, I, I recommend you take a look at that link. So that's, again, the 2019 Eyepiece Buyer's Guide. He's got a 2020 version coming out uh, very soon, but we'll provide you with that link. Thanks, guys.